Well, welcome back. Uh, I, I want to uh, address a comment that somebody made in the back about the cost of uh, ocean observing and the cost of satellites. Well, satellites are expensive, there's no question about it. <clears throat> and there's a whole range of costs of satellites. You can launch small satellites today for just a few thousand to a few hundred thousand dollars. You can launch a very big satellite for, you know, it costs you a thousand million dollars, so a billion dollars. So the, the thing with the, the way that we cost observ observations is uh, very difficult, you know, because we, we're trying to gauge the value of each observation. The advantage of satellites is that you get, in many cases, a global perspective, or you can get very high details, or you can look at phenomena changing over time. So the, the cost per observation is something that we need to look at. Is how much is, is each measurement or point and the cost in dollars. So if you divide, you know, every day you get, you know, 200 million observations or more, or you, you get several gigabytes of data every hour from different satellites, then the cost per observation is very low compared to what you would get from a ship when you're paying 50000 to $100,000 per day for a ship or $400,000 for an airplane per hour, okay, depending on the airplane. So it, it, it's a very relative thing, and yet what is the value that you get? Is, is the science that you're going to get really worth it? You know, it, if you're going to buy a mooring, you're going to put current meters and temperatures and fluorometers, that's not going to cost any less than $100,000 per mooring, and yet you get a time series. And if you go to the beach and collect some sand and do something on a relatively inexpensive way, it may not cost much except your salary. So everything costs money. And this, this whole business revolves around money. Uh, Dan was, uh, no, uh, I think it was Tony, was talking about values and how we value the ocean. I think Tony left, so I can say this. So that we have values that drive how society really uh, uh, manages its resources. But it really comes down to money. And in my view, unfortunately, if you put enough money, you're going to change somebody's values. So we have to be very conscious about that that you, you can overuse resources regardless of what somebody's values are. And our values are to measure the ocean in a way that, that provides benefit, in a way that we can sustain those resources. So money is an issue. It, it is something that we have to deal with on a daily basis. As you move through your careers, you're going to have to find money to do what you want. And that's part of the networking effort, is trying to find sources of support for what we're doing. Anyway, I talked about seascapes that are derived from satellites that have a global perspective. And these, these satellites that I showed you that you know, collect either ice data or wind data or color data, many of them provide global images almost every two or three times per week. And there's some things that we cannot observe with those satellites, and that is where the coastal zones. The coastal zones are where people live, you know, over 50% of people on this planet and, and growing every day live near a coast and we use coastal resources very very uh, intensively fishing you know we we put pollution into the coastal zone we have rivers coming down from the land that affect coastal resources so we would like to find a way to increase the power to make coastal ocean observations if we look at this table and i know it's very hard for anybody to see this in, in, from the back. It's, it's, an, it's an, uh, an effort, we publish this as an effort to map what you can see from satellites in terms of essential biodiversity variables in, uh, So, for the ocean. So the blue box is the only thing that we can routinely today see from space in terms of, of something we can call an essential biodiversity variable. And that's uh, effectively, you know, whether you have chlorophyll concentration in the ocean because we measure the color, and whether that habitat is broken up, be it by eddies or currents or some other thing. So ecosystem structure and some biomass measure. I showed you that we can make some estimates of size of phytoplankton, so that's kind of a little bit of a trait. So those essential biodiversity variable for traits. But the rest of the table is empty or, or orange. We think, and we, we propose, that especially for coastal zones, you can make a lot more measurements of essential biodiversity variables than these orange boxes. So we can probably make measurements of phenology better. Phenology is the seasonal change of biomass or some trait. 
uh, phenology is big because different organisms interact with each other depending on phenology. So you may have uh, an organism that migrates because another organism has a certain biomass cycle. So understanding phenology is really critical. Uh, understanding the size and vertical distribution. Well, we may have a way to measure vertical distribution, at least in the upper few meters of the ocean, with a laser. So we have proven that. We can have a laser in space and we can have a profile of particles in the ocean and if we have a color measurement, we can say whether those particles are living like chlorophyll. We can make measurements of abundance distribution, all of those things that are right now not routinely done. But in the coastal zone, satellites that have a quarter degree pixel resolution or one kilometer pixel resolution or that can make a measurement once a month uh, like from the space station is really not so useful because the, o the coastal ocean changes all the time at very fast time scales and also very over short distances. You know, we, we all know that. So if we want to observe the coastal ocean, we need a satellite that has a completely different set of characteristics. This is an example. This is a, a, an, an image of the Chesapeake Bay uh, of the east coast of the U.S. where each little square here is about one kilometer uh, on the side. So that's what we call a one kilometer resolution in MODIS, CWIFS, uh, AVHRR. Uh, many of the satellites that are flown to make global ocean measurements have one kilometer resolution. So many of the coastal features would be lost. And the picture here is a Landsat picture at 30 meter resolution. So we can see a lot more detail than we would see at quarter degree or one kilometer resolution. So this is an example. So we're trying to promote the idea that uh, we need to go beyond Landsat. Landsat is made to measure land. It's not a very sensitive sensor. It's multispectral as opposed to hyperspectral. So we can measure more colors and we can measure more sensitive. The ocean is a very dark target. So if you look at how much light is reflected by the ocean to measure from, from a satellite, it's very dark. You know, it's, it's uh, blue. It's, you can see browns and things, but this is where you have sediment. But typically, if you have phytoplankton, anything that absorbs light is going to make it even darker. So you need a, a satellite sensor that is very sensitive, that can measure things very quickly, so several times per week, that has a 30-meter resolution, that has extremely high signal-to-noise to ratios. So we're proposing that to measure things like phenology, in this case, I'm not going to go through all this, but the idea is that you can measure phenology from space, and you can identify tra traits or biodiversity patterns by looking at things in time. Because you, if you take only one picture per year, you're going to mix up whatever is in that picture. But if you look at over time, different things are going to have different colors and different expressions, different traits over time. So you can actually measure biodiversity if you, if you measure things over time. That's another dimension that very few people think about, is that it's not just you know, count, taking a bucket of sand and counting it one day. Things are going to look different with seasons and with time over different years. So this idea is here is that you can detect biodiversity over time. We can also use different spectral features, different colors, by, to identify different things. So if we have a, in this case, we have a satellite. This, this here is color. These are wavelengths, so different wavelengths are color. We have blue, green, red, uh, and we have satellites that have only a few bands, so those are called multispectral uh, satellites. But if you have a satellite that gives you a continuous spectrum, a, multi -spec uh, a hyperspectral satellite, you can see things in the colors that you cannot see from a multispectral satellite. So again, you can extract biodiversity information traits if you have a hyperspectral sensor. So if you have high spectral, high temporal, high spatial, high radiometric resolution, you can have more information about biodiversity. And that's what we're pushing right now. We're pushing the US government, we're pushing the European governments, very big time, and something we call H4, high spatial, high temporal, high spectral, high radiometric, uh, so these, these characteristics. And you know, they're, they're paying attention, so maybe uh, they're, they're already bought enough of this idea to have a hyperspectral land satellite that is now being planned. It's going to be launched probably in the next five years. That is uh, called SBG, Surface Biology and Geology. But it's not, it doesn't have the time resolution. It's every 16 days like Landsat. 
to look at things in the coast. It's also m made to look at land, so it's not sensitive enough to look at the, the small variations in color in the ocean. So we need to have high radiometric and high temporal resolution. So we're pushing for that. <laughs> we're continuing with our field work <clears throat> where we're trying to bring together different techniques. And one of the things that we're doing is we're trying to look at patterns in, in biodiversity over longer periods of time in different ways. You know, not only counting fish, reef fish, or or, reef, or, or fish that are caught with fisheries, but we're also trying to do things like eDNA, environmental DNA. So I'll talk a little bit about eDNA. In terms of fish, we're trying to see if the diversity of fish changes with temperature patterns. Something so simple, even that simple, we have not been able to figure out in the ocean. So these papers that are coming out are so simple. They're saying, well, in California, off of California, if the water is warmer, biodiversity goes up, at least in reef fish. So there's, these, these are patterns that uh, we're trying to see if they're repeatable, not just a one-time thing. So with eDNA, eDNA is a, is a new concept that is applied in several different ways. It's kind of the big uh, novelty in, in omics science, where you take a sample of water, just take a bucket or take a bottle, and then try to see what DNA is floating around and try to match it to different databases and see if you can identify what organisms were in contact with that water and then say something about biodiversity. Another way to look at it is if you take a sample of water and look for very specific genes that tell you if a specific species is, was present or not. So people are doing that to look at uh, invasive species, for example. Okay? So you target a specific gene, and uh, so that's, that's also done through the eDNA. Now it's being done actually quite routinely in an operational way. What is not done routinely is surveys of the entire community from microbes to whales that may have been in a specific area. So that's what we're trying to do. We're, we collect water from different places around the, the world. We try to understand what's in that water. There's several expeditions like the Tara expedition that's doing this. There's uh, different field programs that are doing this. So there's a lot of people involved in eDNA work right now. So the idea is that you take different genes or different pieces of uh, genetic material that we call primers and these different things uh, target different uh, so different genes may be representative of different parts of the community like microbes or phytoplankton or invertebrates like zooplankton or coral reefs or fish and so these these different primers target these different communities so we take samples and then uh, replicate the DNA and, and, and try to mark it with these, uh, with these uh, primers. So what we're trying to do now is understand whether patterns in diversity, like off of California or Florida, follow temperature patterns. Again, very simplistic type of things, but trying to do time series of genetic material uh, samples. And yeah, and we find that, yeah, if, you, if the temperature goes higher, typically we find higher diversity, which is it's not clear if, the, if you have different species moving in or if you just have some cryptic species that expresses uh, itself more. There's a technology that part of our group is developing. This is at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, something called uh, Environmental Sample Processor, or ESP. These things, uh, these things uh, are e effectively a sampler that uh, tries to do some genetic uh, uh, a, a sam a processing on board a robot, something that looks like this. Okay. So this technology is coming along, extremely expensive, obviously not easy to deploy, some, but, it, but it's coming along. We're also trying to push the idea that you can have these pipelines for, uh, for genetic data, where you take different, we, we, we published a protocol for eDNA, so we hope that people will adopt standards, that these standards then can be used in different, with different types of primers and that we can have common databases that are useful to identify organisms. So one of the problems with omics and with uh, eDNA and genetics in general is that the databases that you use to identify your species are very incomplete okay, and they're different for different parts of the world. So you cannot just blast uh, a genetic sequence here in Brazil and expect that if your database is in Norway that it will work. So the databases 
that we use for genetic identification are very incomplete and people need to put uh, sequences into these databases. So that, that's a big problem. The other problem is that these comparisons, when you're comparing sequences that are gigabytes long to something in a computer over the network, it takes a long time. And the more comparisons that you have, uh, you, you need very powerful networks and very powerful su supercomputers to do this. So that's another limitation of this technology that we have not addressed as a community. Now we're trying to put together this type, so we're trying to put the satellite information, the in situ information, so temperature, salinity, counts of fish, whatever, uh, eDNA, on some type of a support tool uh, that, it, that is on a computer that you can visualize different patterns. And we've done several experiments with managers, you know, people that should use this information, like a park manager. Like in the Florida Keys, we have the sanctuary managers, and uh, we're working with a sanctuary system in the U.S. And what we find is that they will not use anything that is even half complicated. They will just not use it. Okay, so if they, if they have to go in and uh, click on many buttons and identify data sets, they're not scientists. They are curious. They want to understand how the environment is changing, but they want to have a graph that is, if you click on a website, that uh, the information appears magically and gives a solution and gives you whether it's a, a red marker for if something's in danger or a yellow marker or a green marker. So these very, very simple visualizations are difficult to construct because they have to be, there has to be some forethought on planning them and identifying. Somebody has to construct them, and then it has to be available to these people. But we wasted two years trying to show these tools, we first making the tool, then showing that to them, and then finding out that they don't use it. Okay, they just simply, want, and this is true, I think many of you may have this experience, that if the information is not simple to use, managers will not use it. Okay, they, they will not sit there and play scientist. So, but the information is very complicated. No? So we have, we're working with people that were involved in the uh, 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 building this thing called the Ocean Health Index. Ocean Health Index has a lot of layers. Okay, so has a, it has GIS layers that show you, at least in a coarse resolution, like one kilometer resolution, where the coral reefs are, where the hard bottoms are, uh, where mangroves are. So all of these things are different layers that we are now trying to bring in and intersect in a very simple GIS way with, for example, seascapes or uh, jurisdictions like EPSAS or uh, NPA boundaries or e exclusive economic zone boundaries. So if you wanted to know what the biodiversity is of an intersection between an exclusive economic zone with an EPSA in where there's seamounts, okay? Right now there's no really good tool to do that. You have to do it yourself. And as a scientist with some computer knowledge, maybe you can do that. But there's no real easy way to do this uh, on a routine base on, on, over the whole world. But yet we have the information, for example, if you had a good complete OBIS database and you had databases like this and you have the satellite data and you have the Argo float data, you can start piecing some of this stuff together in a way that can give you a lot of information on a jurisdictional basis. Okay, so that's, that's where we're going with this. So we're trying to make things that are complicated, like an interface like this where you can bring in biodiversity data, satellite data, overlay, uh, marine regions like exclusive economic zones, and yet uh, that may be interesting for us or it may be interesting for a country that is trying to provide an indicator to the CBD or to the sustainable development goals, but a manager of a park is not going to use that. So what a manager of a park wants is a simple cartoon with a fish that looks or a little cartoon of a turtle. They want to click on it and they want to see, okay, this, there were so many nesting areas or there was so much biomass or there was a red tide uh, at this point or not, and then look at, at it over time. So that we're, we're developing these things that we call infographics jointly with the National Marine Sanctuary in the U.S., and these things could be exported to other groups around the world. So they're very simple. They're open source. Everything is available through, uh, uh, you know, you can copy the, the core code is R code, and so there's, a, there's ways that you can propagate this uh, to different communities. So we just click on it and you get a time history. Many government agencies have this history. They just have it in different formats. 
have it distributed in, in different databases. So we're trying to harvest all of that, force it into OBIS, and so this would connect to OBIS or some satellite time series where you get temperature and then you can compare the temperature, something like this, to what you get from, from OBIS. Okay. So this is what the interface looks like. We call it the MBON portal. It's global. We bring in satellite data. We're thinking about bringing in numerical model data so you can look at layers. You can overlay or you can bring in uh, biodiversity data like OBIS data, so counts, richness, uh, that sort of thing. You can filter for species. You can look at graph it over time and then uh, do it for specific regions that you can trace by hand, like a region of interest, or you can, it, it's not available yet, but we want to bring in uh, things like marine protected area boundaries or EPSAs or other, other types of uh, boundaries and intersected with different layers like habitat layers that, are, that already exist. <coughs> so this is a, an example of an infographic. We have very simple cartoons. And then if you click on a cartoon, you get a time series. <coughs> the idea then is that we take satellite data for global coverage or even regional coverage for high resolution data. You can go to an area, you can get an infographic, get time series in, intersected with these different habitat layers. Okay, so if you have an MPA uh, and you want to look at the layers that are deeper than 10 meters, then you would be able to select a bathymetry uh, layer. Okay, so these things are now possible, but to do it in a way that is useful, it's going to take a lot of thinking, a common thinking, because an, an MPA manager uh, in South America may have a different need from an MPA manager in the Florida Keys. Although we're thinking that maybe they do have common needs. And so that's how our conversation with the sanctuary managers is very important because they have a series of questions that they have that every seven years, every five years or so, they have to come up with a condition report for the sanctuary. And these condition reports are uh, written by a few people after consulting with a number of experts that give them information like in a room like this. And so people discuss, well, is the temperature going up and down? If the temperature is going up, then they call it red, it's in danger. Or if the coral reef cover is going down, then somebody says, yeah, it's going down, and they put it in red. But it's all very people intensive and with, with uh, n it's not an automated thing that every time or every year they can track things uh, because the databases are so dispersed in this different formats and all of you are familiar with this so the, the, the problem is getting access to data even historical data that may exist already. Another thing that we are trying to do with this tool is something that we call an alert system. The, the, an example of this is what the Coral Reef Watch people do in, at NOAA. They have a, a system that allows them to identify areas of possible bleaching around the world. If the temperature is above a certain number of degrees for several weeks, then they, they, they send out an alert and you can get an email uh, for your region. So you can say, okay, I wanna, I'm interested in this region of Fiji. And so you can say, mark it. That thing will then send you an email if you have a, a bleaching conditions, so high temperatures. It's, right now it's just based on temperature. But the idea is to build alert systems where you can have a, based on ocean color, if you have a turbidity issue, if the turbidity over time is moving closer to your park, that you can then get an email that wakes you up in the middle of the night and, you know, it, it kind of gives you a jolt and say, hey, wake up, something's happening. Very, these are simple things because nowadays with long time series, we can look at uh, define a baseline, regardless of what the baseline is, what we are interested in is in change. Okay? So we just want to see, did it, does it look different today from what it was yesterday? Okay? So it doesn't have to be an absolute measure. It, we're just looking at change. And so the, the idea is to have these things uh, tied to, to you know, technology that's available everywhere today. Let me tell you a little bit about OBIS so that you're at least familiar with it because uh, what we're trying to do is force people to use this technology for sharing data. Uh, this, this presentation was done by Eduardo Klein. Eduardo is a professor at the University Simón Bolívar in Venezuela. Uh, he's now living in Australia, but Eduardo is the chair of the science steering group for OBIS. So OBIS is, you know, an impressive database. It has over 50 million records. It's, it is growing. Uh, it, it, it does have, you know, over near, near 10,000 records per day went in 
last year. So that's not insignificant, and yet it's, it's nothing compared com to what we actually need. It's got several nodes around the world. So these are the OBIS. OBIS works in a distributed way. So there's a, a many different countries around the world serve as the local OBIS nodes. Uh, some nodes are very active. Some nodes do nothing. So this is a problem. Uh, and if you try to contact the node from your country, uh, in some cases, they're very helpful. And they help you move your data into the OBIS, into the Darwin core. In some cases, they do nothing. And it's very frustrating. So. But there are other groups, you know, there's a, the, the, the office in Belgium is very helpful. People like Eduardo is helpful. The group on MBON is very helpful. So if, you, if your own country node doesn't, doesn't respond, you can write us and we will help you move your data into OBIS. So this is what the data, of all the data looks like. If you, this is integrated from the surface to the bottom of the ocean. This is what it kind of looks like. Before I showed you a picture of the only the upper 20 meters of the ocean. It has lots of holes. But if you combine, combine it all, it has pretty good coverage. But it's, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a holy data set. Okay. It's lots of holes. Uh, if you look at the, the number of records, of course, most of them are uh, near the coast or in continental shelf areas. And that's true also for the number of species and the number, number of sampling events. So, these things are kind of confounded. So yes, of course, we expect to have fewer species in the deep ocean compared to the coast. And yet, there's a sampling problem. Okay, so it, you never know exactly uh, where we are and how to untangle this at the, at the moment. And this is what I showed before. So one of the things that we're trying to do is, um, under the AMBON umbrella, to organize people, in, in this case, this is a pilot project that we call Pole to Pole in the Americas. And we're trying to do that uh, under GEOS, with AmeriGEOS, there's the GEOS for the Americas, with Goose and with OBIS. And this, we had a workshop uh, a year ago in Mexico. We had another one uh, a couple weeks ago in Sebimar in Sao Sebastiao, just a couple hours away from here, where we brought people from different countries and and try to talk about protocols in terms of intertidal, rocky shore sampling, you know, simplest thing possible, and also for beaches. So some of you were here uh, at this workshop. Uh, and what I would like to encourage you all, if you're interested in this, call us. Give us a call. We will work with you to share this protocol. It may not be the same protocol that you're using right now, but if you can impose or add some simple measurements in the same protocol and then share the data through OBIS, you, you're very welcome. The whole point here is, if you don't want to share the data, forget it. Don't call. Okay. <laughs> we are trying to look at uh, essential ocean variables and essential biodiversity variables. This is a very big challenge because OBIS is trying to position itself to be the database for essential biodiversity variables and essential ocean variables. So variables for the ocean. And we've made a, an, a formal agreement between the IOC and MBON that helps this flow from defining requirements. So we published a paper that looks at many, many different uh, international treaties, national requirements, defining the, the requirements for EOVs. We're trying to come up with ideas for uh, EBVs under, o under MBON, and we're coordinating with OBIS to collect these data. <coughs> and a lot of this takes a lot of outreach. So this is part of the pole-to-pole -pole effort, is training people, getting things out on the newsletter. We have training courses. We're working with the IOC, with OBIS. They, they have this a Global Ocean Teacher Academy. So if you want to have a course on this, that we can organize and invite you to courses that teach you about OBIS and how to use these standards. We're doing this all over the place. And in terms of the pole-to-pole -pole or P2P, is uh, we're trying to implement these type of interfaces where we have the uh, overlaying the marine regions, you know, jurisdictions in the ocean, with things like satellite data. And if you click on something like this, you would get the OBIS records for that location or that EEZ and the, for example, the temperature averaged over this EEZ. And the idea is to do this for small areas, big areas. If, if you have a, something like the 
ecological significant uh, EPSAs, uh, intersecting one of your areas that you would only look at that intersection and so on. So again, we have the, the uh, field sampling protocols, capacity building efforts, uh, trying to go and, and encourage people to use these new tools. And the whole point is to address these, uh, make it useful. Okay, so the, the whole question is how do you ma make these things useful to people? Okay, so we have uh, you know, th these uh, international frameworks like the Sustainable Development Goals or the Aichi targets from the Convention on Biological Diversity. You have national needs. So what are the products that you can make in a simple way that are the most informative? And so, I'm gonna skip this. So, so participate in poll to poll. These are the people I mentioned before: uh, Savannah, Kara, and Luis. And most of, many of you know them. There were other people. If you identify yourselves to people that were in the workshop, then maybe you can help recruit more people. But one of the things that we want to do is define indicators. And so the question is: well, what, what is an indicator? Everybody talks about indicators, and yet there are very few really useful indicators. And so I, I want to spend some time in defining what people mean by an indicator and how it's, they are applied. And so uh, we, we, think, we do things like measure temperature. Well, temperature is not really a, an indicator except when we use it uh, on a regional basis. But uh, in a way it is, because if you measure the temperature of the, this room, it's an indication that you may be hot or not. Okay, but it's, it's, uh, so it's a measure. Okay, we have simple measures like distance and temperature and so on. A metric is the system that we use. It could be a metric system, it could be an English system. We have an index uh, that may be unitless. Okay, it could be a, a, we, like the biodiversity indices that we use. But the indicator is something that is actually, the, the intent of the indicator is that it, it provides more information than the measure itself. Okay, so, and I'll show you some examples of what that means. So the, it's, a, it's a measure based on verifiable data, so it has a scientific basis. It can be replicated and can be used over and over again to look at change, okay? And it, but the, the measure has to mean something more than just temperature, okay? It has to have a bigger context and ideally applicable to, uh, to take action. So uh, indicators are purpose dependent, so there may be different indicators for different purposes, and again, I'll show you a, an example. And so there, this, this whole concept uh, is described in different, liter in different pieces of literature. In this case, I'm using something called the Biodiversity Indicator Partnership, BIP. So there's a website here, or look it up, uh, BIP, Biodiversity Indicator Partnership. And they explain a, a process whereby you can build an indicator that is useful. Okay, useful means that it's used. If nobody uses your indicator, forget it. Let's throw it away. Okay? It, it doesn't work. It's not an indicator because nobody uses it. So you need to identify the, the needs for some particular measure, work with stakeholders, and then have a, a model, some conceptual idea of what an indicator may be, and then construct it. You have a, 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 a reporting system. The reporting system can be uh, it's very difficult to build, to have something that is used by people, that is distributed, and that is easily accessible. And then you may have a feedback loop where you test and over-test and refine the indicator. So th these ideas of loops are very important. Where it, whatever you end up with has to be tested with stakeholders to get improved. Okay, that, that feedback loop, back loop is very important. So here's the... The BIP webpage, there are several manuals on how people have developed indicators for different things like uh, forest cover, okay? Uh, and, and so take a look at that. And the, um, and the way that people track indicators at the international level is through, is through stat statistical offices. So uh, I know people have mentioned SDGs over and over, but I think that you have not gotten into the details and the how how in, uh, these indicators are made and, or, or what it means. And the, the problem is that very few of these indicators have been developed to a point where they're useful. Because so the people that are involved in quantifying indicators at the UN level are these, there's this st statistical office of the United Nations. 
but they gather information from different countries. Like the, the, the United States has a group of statisticians that live within the White House, even today's White House. They're following the SDGs. And so they're, they're within the Office of Management and Budget. And every country has a set of statisticians within a statistical office that reports to the UN on SDGs. Okay, so the, and the, the statistics are accumulated in this website for whatever indicator works. There's an example indicator here where for Brazil, uh, we know that Brazil has an issue with people cutting trees. So this is a, an, uh, an indicator or a forest cover. And you, you, do, you build these indicators by using satellite data and C2 data, surveys of people, all kinds of stuff go into this indicator to show trends. Okay? Uh, this, uh, it, and the indicator is not just an empty number. It tells you something about resources. You know, are the resources going up and down? Can you say something about are you reaching a specific conservation target or not? Are you far away or not? Uh, can you say something about the threats? So there's a lot of information that you can derive from an indicator beyond whether it's hot or cold. There's another example where you have um, forest cover in uh, Costa Rica. You may have uh, a more sophisticated indicators that people are coming up. One indicator that is uh, directly associated with sustainable development goals is what is the total area of marine protected areas in the world? Okay. That number in itself is not so useful, although it is an indicator. It is being tracked. It's being published, and I'll show you. But the idea is, well, can you really make um, uh, a better indicator? Can you show how many MPAs have effect effective management? Okay, so this is an, an attempt to do this, uh, and you do it typically as a ratio. The area of MPAs divided by the EEZ of a country, that's a very useful indicator for a specific country. This is a... <clears throat> Dan showed something like this. This, this is tracked by, by the World Conservation Monitoring Center of the, of the UN Environment in the United Nations. They have uh, this indicator that shows the percentage you know, per EZ and different colors for a country. But it also shows uh, on a line basis for individual countries and then it shows the total for the whole world whether you have MPA area going up or down. So, Again, this indicator is being tracked, it's formal, it is a, something tracked by the United Nations, and yet it's not so useful. Okay? Because as we talked about a couple days ago, or yesterday, uh, if it's not being managed effectively, it's just a paper protected area where you know, if the resources are not truly protected. So what makes a an indicator successful or not? It has to be valid from a scientific point of view, so there has to be some theory, some method uh, that is accepted in the literature that, that supports the, you know, th there is evidence based, okay? So you have to have a, a process to get to it. Uh, the data is reliable, so calibrated, verifiable, repeatable, all of the things that we have to deal with in science. There's not something that I measure today and tomorrow may be totally different because it's uncalibrated. So it's, it has to be available and reproducible, so it has to be based on uh, available data. So that's why it's so important for us to share data because people are trying to do these things. No data, no indicator. It has to be responsive to change. If, if it's unresponsive, who cares? It has to be easily understandable, like this area of MPA is uh, it's easy to understand. Yeah, area of MPAs is going up. No, it's going down. Or forest cover is going up. Or coral reef cover is going up or down. If, if it's not that easily uh, uh, understood, it's not useful. It has to be relevant to somebody's needs to make policy, and then it has to be used. If it's not used, well, then it's useless, right? <laughs> so how do, you, how do people apply this to things like are important to all of us, like the Aichi targets, sustainable development goals? I'm not going to read this. You can go online and see what these different targets are. Just be aware that... These are supposed to be uh, achieved by 2020, you know, in a year and a half. We're not going to get there. Right? So how do we know that? How do we know that we're not getting there? 
there's all these these reports are published uh, every few years, you know, and these are this is the format that the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, uses to track indicators. They have these little arrows. It's going up, stays the same, going down. It, they have a little little stars to show the uncertainty around that indicator. So it's a very clever way to to show whether an indicator is uh, you know being tracked usefully or not. So the, the visualization of these things is very important. For the sustainable development goals, again, we are here uh, on, I don't know why they call it life below water, but I think it's the worst possible uh, name that they could have given this because birds, seabirds are not underwater. We are not underwater, we're part of this thing. But that's the way it is, you know, some politician decided it was cute. So the SDGs, you've gone over that. There's 17 of these goals. There, there's a lot of targets underneath each one of the sustainable development goals. And the way that we want to know if we're meeting those targets is through indicators. Okay? So <clears throat> I'm not, I'm not going to go through this, but there's linkages between the Aichi targets and sustainable development goals that you should be familiar with. There are issues that uh, obviously we're not going to meet the Aichi targets, so people are now coming through uh, rethinking the Aichi targets. So there's going to be a whole process of reinventing them in 2020. And w the same thing for the sustainable development goals. The problem with the sustainable development goals is these indicators. So we have uh, in, in terms of MBON, is we are trying to address issues of indicators under Sustainable Development Goal 14, and those link to other Sustainable Development Goals. But we're trying to find the indicators that deal with biodiversity that are relevant to Sustainable Development Goal 14. So, uh, one of the issues is, and have you talked about the tier classification of indicators for SDGs or no? Okay, so the Sustainable Development Goals indicators are uh, classified by tiers, tier one, two, or three. Tier one indicators are those that are, have a, a, are those that are useful, that I showed have an established methodology, people can reproduce, people are using them, like the area of MPAs. That's a tier one indicator. But if we have, most indicators are tier three. So tier three is nobody has any idea how to do it. Okay, so uh, they're just really high, lofty, we are going to stop plastics in the ocean. Well, okay, but how do you track that? Uh, we're going to measure pH in the ocean everywhere. Well, how do you do that? So these are real uh, indicators that people have proposed, and yet we don't know how to achieve a global measure per country that gets fed up through these statistical offices to, to aggregate them at the global level. So they are now tier three. The problem is that you know, most, if you look at, uh, at the, just last year, <coughs> out of 100, nearly 170 indicators, you know, only 82 are tier one, and the rest are uh, not really well defined. And there's an issue, is that tier three indicators that, are, that may try to track a very important goal for sustainable development, if we cannot convert them or, or propose a technology or method to move them to at least tier two, they may disappear. And in fact, the whole target may disappear uh, in a couple of years. Okay? So this is an issue because some of these sustainable development goals are very good, very important. And yet, if we cannot track them, they're going to fall off the table or they may be, I mean, there's a whole process of rethinking how we're going to repropose these things after 2020. But this process is ongoing now, and your group, the type of thing that you're learning in this class, is very important to try to find ways to move these indicators from tier three to tier three, and ideally to tier one. Okay, so how do you do that? How, how can we work together to do that? Okay, what technology do we need to do that? These things are tracked then by things that, uh, organisms that are uh, called custodian agencies, and there's a lot of jockeying into position politically, even within the United Nations, about who is a custodian for which indicator. Okay, for example, uh, the, 
within the UN Environment Organization, there's a regional seas uh, framework. And the regional seas is trying to position itself to be the reviewer of marine indicators. Okay? And even within the UN, okay, you have FAO, they're trying to position themselves to do everything to do with fish and food. Uh, you have WCMC, also part of the UN environment, trying to do marine protected areas. And so there's a lot of competition. All of these things are happening within the UN, and they expect different countries to provide that information to them. <clears throat> so under SDG 14, we have 10 targets, so each one at the moment has one indicator officially. Uh, just two of them are classified as Tier 1, so only two of them are tracked. The rest have uh, really no, uh, not even an official custodian, even though we know that for, there's several of the SDGs that have to, the SDG 14 targets that have to do with fish, so FAO is trying to position, position itself to be the custodian agency. There's covered gaps in terms of, you know, how different indicators relate to each other. Some indicators are not well aligned to the actual target. So the, 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 if you go on these web pages, you will find that there is an indicator. I'll show you a table, but it's going to be hard to read. But each target has an indicator, and yet, you know, it's almost useless. These are the, uh, the targets for SDG 14. I'm not going to read them. There are 10. Some of them are very interesting because they have to do with knowledge transfer and technology transfer. And the IOC, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, is directly mentioned in here for uh, transfer of marine technology. So we're actually tracking the number of students, for example, that take OBIS courses. It's something that we're thinking could be an indicator for this target. <coughs> I'm not going to read this. These, are, these, again, are the targets. And you can, can go online. You can see all this. And you can see the the proposed indicators, so, so the, there, there are many, there's hundreds of proposed indicators, many of them with no basis uh, on reality. So these are tables that are being published now online where you can see uh, for a specific target in SDG 14 or any other of the SDG goals and targets, <coughs> the proposed indicators and whether they're tier 3 or tier 2 or tier 1. Okay, so you should go online, check this out, see if you have ideas on... You can actually go online and propose your own indicator. So I'm, I'm not going to read this, but this, you can see that there's, there's a lot of effort that goes into this. What we're trying to do with Emon, I know you cannot read this, but we're trying to select specific targets where we can go in and look at how GeoBond with essential biodiversity target uh, variables or Goose with essential ocean variables whether we can take some of these things and make them relevant to specific uh, tar indicators or targets of SDG 14. We're trying to compare what the relationship is between SDG targets and IHE targets and see if we can, you know, if the same indicator would work. And there's a lot of issues that we're trying to resolve right now, whether whether we have the data, whether it's in the right format, how do we aggregate it, uh, how do we convince people to use standards, because even though there's, everybody kind of knows how to measure chlorophyll, the truth is that everybody measures it different, and so there's 15 standards, okay? So the problem is, it's not that in oceanographer you don't, we don't have standards, we have too many standards, okay? And they're all different. So we have to, go through this capacity building effort of agreeing on at least a, f a few common measures that we can track. And then uh, understanding how we can transform that, that information into something that the public can consume. So these are, this, this is uh, something that we're working with with the sanctuaries in the United States where they're trying to, uh, they have these um, questions that link activities in the sanctuary like tourism or pollution or something to uh, some of them have to do with biodiversity. So we're trying to identify which, o which of these questions have to do with biodiversity and then inform the sanctuary so that they can come up with their, uh, you know, their uh, red, green, yellow type of indicator. So what we're recommending is that we have uh, a global uh, push 
to highlight the importance of life in the ocean, that agencies, government agencies, adopt interoperable schema for sharing data. We also want to convince manufacturers, like the manufacturers of a flow cytometer or a manufacturer of, a, of, a, of an automated microscope that has artificial intelligence to classify organisms, that they spit out the data in the Darwin Core format. It's going to take a long time before industry agrees to something like that. We're developing eDNA applications, and we're trying to figure out what the cost is. The government in the United States is very interested in doing this, for example, for fisheries applications, uh, for in looking at invasive species. So there's money being put toward this. We're trying to understand indicators and what, uh, what their application is for these different uh, IEAs, Integrated Ecosystem Assessment. That's something that we're going through in the United States also. Uh, we're trying to understand seascapes and how technologies like satellite data help us. If we cannot measure biodiversity automatically, can we make global assessments based on satellite data in a cheap way? Right? We're trying to develop early warning systems. If something changes, alert us. So some of these technologies are, again, all you need is a baseline. The baseline doesn't have to be absolute. We don't have to go back 200 years to build the baseline. The baseline can be done today. And based on that, you can measure change. All you need is a, is a robust thing that you have confidence about that you can measure change against, be it in time or in space. Okay, so, and if, once you have that, you can develop a warning system. Ah. We need to find support uh, from users for these portals and, uh, and understand how to develop simple tools. Trying to work with these international organizations to have an international framework for sharing these ideas. So that's what we call the MBON. And work with uh, things like the IOC. Another thing that I didn't mention, but the IOC has a best practices, an ocean best practices group. Uh, the ocean best practices group is actually old. It's, it's, it's something that was established several decades ago. But it was not very used. And so what we're trying to do now is revamp it, put a new interface on it, put new artificial intelligence and semantic searches on it. So that whenever you put in a, a methodology or, a, or a, a, an analysis method into the IOC best practices web page, that you can find it. So you can just type salinity, and it gives you all the things that are related. And even we'll go out onto the web and search for salinity and give you the reason. So the new technologies for semantic context and searches is something that we're trying to implement through this Ocean Best Practices group. It's very active. If you want to get engaged, uh, let us know. The challenges are, you know, getting support from partnerships. If we don't have uh, partners, this is not going to work. <coughs> Developing useful products for tracking life in the ocean, it's not easy. Uh, as Dan said that tracking people is easier than tracking biology. I don't believe that. Okay. It's very difficult to track biology. Uh, having good visualization tools that are useful and simple. Uh, you know, validating and implementing eDNA methods that are standard and sustained over time is difficult. Curating these data sets is difficult and costly, even though OBIS exists and exists within the United Nations at UNESCO. They have three people okay, in, at the office in Belgium, and then they have these distributed offices. It's very costly to, to do this and sustain it. So governments have to agree to participate. <coughs> you know, everybody adopting Darwin Core is a challenge. We have tried, we have promoted it. Different people have different ways to storing data. And the worst thing is that every time you have uh, in, in science, okay, if you get a project, then I store the data whichever way I, in, a, in an Excel sheet that I, I feel is the best way. People are not following standards. So to promote the idea of people following standards and standards for metadata is very difficult. And then to get the data converted after your project ends into some standard format is even more difficult because people don't have the money, they don't care, they don't want to do it, and so the data is potentially lost forever. So. <clears throat> Transitioning into a permanent archive is difficult, and uh, we want to enroll monitoring programs into adopting these standards. Communication, very important, and integrating 
biological observations into the existing observing framework is another thing that we're trying to push. That's what we're trying to hang the idea that uh, we want to work with GOOSE, the, with the Global Ocean Observing System, because traditionally, for the past 20, 30 years, GOOSE has measured temperature, salinity, and that's about it. Okay, so uh, they're now going into measuring oxygen, they're measuring fluorescence, they're going into something more biogeochemical, and we have to convince people that these platforms that are distributed globally should also measure biology, okay? Because that's ultimately, if nothing was living on this planet, who would care, no? That's, you know, we measure things because we care as living organisms, and we may want to go there someday. So if there's no biology on this universe, you know, who would care? Nobody. So life has to do with all of this stuff. Anyway, uh, that's my lecture, so if you have questions or we want to talk for a little bit, I'll be happy to. Hi, uh, I'm Avi from Sri Lanka. Uh, well, uh, my question uh, relates to uh, the pole observations. Uh, because uh, I used to work with uh, MODIS data for a little while, Aqua and Terra, and uh, I worked with uh, sea level rise, um, SST and uh, chlorophyll. So a problem we had, actually I had, was you know you don't have enough data for the poles, for the polar oceans. So uh, I, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you mentioned about uh, using MODIS data. Uh, to map the ocean. So uh, I just want to know uh, the complications and the problems you encountered uh, in uh, mapping uh, the polar oceans and how you overcame. Yeah, it, it, this is a very, very good question. I, mean, I don't know how many people here have uh, understand how we measure phytoplankton biomass in the ocean using satellites. And the most common measure, which is one of the EBVs that I showed, is looking at color to make an index of biomass. Okay. <clears throat> the way that works is that you take a picture uh, of the ocean during daytime, it doesn't work at nighttime, you measure the color. In that, and you, so you use the sun, reflected light from the sun, to measure the color. If there's no light, no color. Okay. So it, it's a simple measure of the amount of blue light absorbed by the water relative to the green light that is reflected or absorbed. <clears throat> so we measure blue light reflected and green light reflected, and we make a, a ratio of those two. So if there's more blue light absorbed, that means, in principle, that there's more chlorophyll. So the problem is not just the poles. The, po the problem is every coastal zone where you have a river, you have stuff there absorbing blue light. Okay, so it, it looks like in these pictures you have a lot of chlorophyll in coastal zones when a lot of that is maybe dissolved organic matter that is colored, or you may have sediment, or you may be looking at the bottom. So we're trying to resolve these issues by having better cameras. This is the H4 concept that I described. But there's another issue, and if, that is, if you have no light, you have no color, you have no measure of phytoplankton. And that's what happens in the high latitudes uh, for eight months out of the year. You know, six months out of the year, you have no light, and that's a seasonal phenomenon and you also have ice. So if you have ice, we cannot see the, the, what's below that, so we cannot measure, make the measurement. So there's an, a very important combination of in situ technology with satellites to figure this out. Now, in the, in the one new concept about uh, how you could address this in the poles is with lasers. So we, we have had at least two lasers in space. One is still operating called Calypso. So a laser, uh, sh uh, shoots light and you can measure the, the light pulses very accurately. So you can measure the time travel of these light pulses and you can make a profile of particles in the ocean. So they're, they're designed to make particle profiles in the atmosphere, but they're so powerful that you can get a profile of particles in the ocean. So Calypso has been used to demonstrate the idea that at least in the upper ocean, the upper 20 meters, upper 30 meters, you can get a profile uh, of particles, okay? or, and so a laser generates its own light, right? So you can measure things at night. So the idea is to have a, a new generation of lidars, lasers, that can profile particles and tell you something about the concentration of phytoplankton 
in polar areas during the polar night. So that's, that's one of the ideas that, that is, is being promoted. It's, uh, satellites are expensive, so promoting the idea of a LIDAR in space to do ocean profiling is exciting, but it, we haven't gotten there yet. There, there are LIDARs, for example, to, to measure the topography of ice, because it's, you know, there's, there's priorities in the way that we launch satellites. So atmospheric profiles are very important. The profile of ice, because we're losing ice, and so that's a, we need to have an indicator for that. Those are priorities that have been established before doing vertical profiles of phytoplankton in the ocean. So we're getting there. There's a, a large group of people that is pushing for this, and the more people that are interested, the more letters are written to agencies like NASA and ESA or IMPE, the, the, the faster these things will happen. But th that's one of the ideas to address the, uh, the issue of not being able to measure color in the polar zones. And so there, th but the idea that we need to make in situ measurements at the same time and combine them is, is probably the best solution. Uh, well, I have a follow-up question, actually. Uh, so now this is about, uh, this is, uh, about uh, uh, going for high technology uh, to achieve these, I mean, to uh, overcome these obstacles. But uh, uh, we know as, 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 as a fact that uh, there's not many satellites that complete the full orbit when it comes to the orbit, ob uh, orbit of the satellite. So MODIS is uh, a sun-synchronous satellite, so it does not cover the whole orbit of the Earth, which means it cannot go too much up to the poles. As far as I know, only Cryosat can do that, but no. I'm not so sure. No, that's not true. Okay. I mean, uh, uh, there, there are many orbits, an infinite number of orbits. These polar orbiters, and, and the Aqua and Terra are on a polar orbit, they're a little bit off the pole, but they're at 98 degrees, you know, so it's just a few degrees off the pole. But the swath is so broad that they cover the pole. The problem is that there's ice, and in Antarctica it's, it's land. So, but Landsat covers the pole, you know, many, many, unless you have a very narrow swath, then maybe you don't cover the pole with a polar orbiter. The idea, these, these satellites are inclined a little bit from the actual axis of rotation so that they precess, so that the next day, you get a little bit of a different part of the world the next day, and so it, they eventually they repeat, like MODIS or, or Terra and Aqua repeat every three days, Landsat repeats every 16 days, and so you can time the, the, the inclination to, so that you can repeat the orbit track every so often. But MODIS covers the pole. The thing is that you cannot see anything because there's ice or, or darkness. So uh, th that's the problem. The other extreme is a geostationary satellite where you park over the equator, and then you rotate with the speed of the Earth. You know? So you're always looking at the same hemisphere, day, night, and so on. Uh, and so you rotate, at, at, but you cannot see the pole because you're looking at the equator. So because of the curvature of the Earth, you cannot see the pole. Yeah. And you anyway, geostationary satellites don't, it's not their purpose to like cover the whole Earth. No, exactly. Yeah. You, you only they're, see There's meteorological satellites. You see a hemisphere. Yeah. But then you have to have several, and we do, that's, we, we do that for, for weather, we're also actually measuring temperature, and now we're measuring color from geostationary satellites, like the Japanese have one, the Koreans have one. Uh, but you're only looking at that spot or the hemisphere, and so you have to have several around the Earth to look at at least the tropics and subtropics you cannot see. And then you have something in between. You, know? you have many orbits that are in between, like the space station that has a crazy orbit that fluctuates between maybe 52 degrees south 52 degrees north, but you're never seeing the same spot on the Earth. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, okay. it's a Thank hard you. point to reduce. Hello, uh, is anyone else waiting for a question? Okay, uh, Lorena from Brazil. Um, you asked me yesterday about if I was measuring the abundance of the species that I was working with, and I kept thinking overnight about it because um, I'm not. Uh, it's just I do some samplings in some places, and that's not the real abundance. And is it possible? I didn't really get it. If, is it possible for me to like use any of those tools that you presented to measure the abundance that specific species that I'm working with, like a fish species? Well, uh, maybe yes, maybe not. I need to understand the situation a little bit better. There may be historical databases already that are in OBIS. You never know. You should check. Or in GBIF. 
But if they're not, you should put your data in there and start that process, no? There may be data that other people have collected within a government agency that you should track. There's, and, and that's what we're trying to do in Florida and California and different states. In the U.S., going back to these agencies that have a mandate to collect data, but they, they store it for their internal purposes in different formats and they just use it for management locally, but they don't, they're not really available and they're not available to compare like uh, sea grasses with fish. I mean, so they're completely different databases. So every time you want to use them, you have to reconvert them and you know, reproject them and so on. So we're trying to bring them into these systems where you, they're all in a, in a standard format. But in your case, I, I don't know, the, the tools are available. So the, the R code to do these projections and maps are, is available. And you know, we can sit down and, and yeah, I can Maybe I'll have to start doing for my area because I don't believe that there's any information yeah, there, there may yet. not be in many, like, uh, I mean, in many places there is no available data. Somebody may have collected it, but it's yeah. not available. Oh, thank you. Thank you for uh, your lecture. It, it was very interesting. Um, you were uh, speaking about this uh, environmental DNA. And my question is if it is possible to, to, or if there is any approach to do something like a stratigraphic environmental DNA approach, like a, um, a measure or detected DNA in a, a soil cores, or uh, to compare with data of uh, environmental changes and try to relate uh, the responses of um, earlier cl climate changes with biodiversity or something like that. Do you know? Well, I, I, I do think that people on land and uh, people that are doing limnology have used eDNA to look at invasive species. And so there may be some time series. But there's not a comprehensive approach like this thing we're trying to do from microbes to whales. That's a new thing where you use four or five different primers to look at different segments of the, of the community. That's relatively new. It's, it is, I think, the way that things are gonna be done in the future. But the way to do it is you start a time series, you start doing it. Uh, I'm sure that there's people looking at soil DNA. We're not doing that, but it's something that I'm sure a lot of people are doing in the terrestrial community, so you should look at it. And how you look at how you link that to climate change, well, you have to have something that gives you a time series of some sort that goes way back. You know, uh, it's clear that anything that happens within a, a five-year or ten-year time frame may be related to climate change, but it, it, you're not able to separate it from other signals. So it's it's not clear to me how how you would do that by having. Uh, just a few measurements. So you have to start a program to make that type of measurement and, and it's, what you're describing is probably very costly, so you have to make sure that it's worth it. Okay, thanks. Hello, thank you for your presentation, very good. I am, uh, Thinking about open data and open access, uh, I used to work in this, but for journals and you know, other things. But this cooperation and this culture of open data for us is very important. And also in a project that is untidy from EIE, yeah, how to say? IAI, IAI, IAI is the yes. in, in, <laughs> Inter-American Institute for yes. Global Change Research. We have a project there that I am doing the. Um, popularization of science in this project, but um, they are struggling in making the reports because the, the countries that are in the project, they are not sharing the data even when they sign it that they, they will do it. So for me, it's so... Well, for me, it's extremely frustrating because I'm one of the creators of Antares when... I, yeah, sorry. So I, I sat down with, <laughs> with Milton Campbell and with... Uh, 
Vivian Lutz and group yes. in Argentina one day and we created the project. Uh -huh. And then I was in, in the IAI and we funded the project. And then people don't share the data and say, what? Yes. It's crazy. That's yeah, very frustrating. I started in the project in October, last, last October in Colacmar. And then I, I met everybody and for me, it's, it's uh, well, they, they don't unbelievable. Share temperature. They don't share chlorophyll data, it's let alone the yes. taxonomy data. So I don't understand it. I've tried, I've tried to talk to people, and they're protective of their students. They're afraid that somebody will steal the data from a thesis. And yes. so these, these, this, these fears, to me, are, are unwarranted. Uh, the student will benefit more if they share the data. More people will work with them. More people will approach them and include them. Yeah, somebody may steal the data. Somebody may go in a private company and write on a consulting report mm -hmm. for an environmental impact statement. Uh, this mm -hmm. happens all the time. Yes. But the, the culture of sharing data, for example, the meteorologists learned this a long time ago. Yes. We would not have the meteorological reports and an understanding in driving models mm -hmm. for weather if people didn't share the data. Yeah. We would, the physical oceanographers are sharing the data. So all that stuff that you saw from GQs, all these buoys, totally open, totally open. You can go in there, you can go to a website, you can get the profiles of these buoys, totally open. And the, the day that biologists understand the power of sharing data, yes. we'll have a revolution. Oh, it's in, like in the biology. genome project. It's yeah, all based totally in share. It's yeah. if, you, if you don't share, right. you don't ha have So yeah, I, I agree with your frustration. I understand it. Uh, I, I was I think asking you for a, co a, a tip for... Well, the tip is, uh, you know, you want to be part of our network, you share the data. You don't want to share your data, you're not part of the network. It's that simple. And I don't, I don't understand the funding, the, f the funding organisms that don't... Eventually those people are going to, you know, they, they get their, there. There are true restrictions on data, like fisheries data have real restrictions because mm -hmm. there's commercial interest. Mm -hmm. uh, th so if the data are collected with a commercial interest or a defense purpose, yeah. I understand there, there are restrictions and you cannot share some types of data. But when we're trying to build indicators for how the world is changing in, for the benefit of the public, mm -hmm. then we should think of what yes. data can we share and what data should we not share. Yes. We don't have to share everything. We want to, to know about ecosystem services, so it's yeah. not really money. And uh, the other question, oh, may I? No? Thank Hello, I'm Latoya from Namibia. I've attended uh, OBIS training in Kenya this year, February, for f I think four or five days. And after we have, to, uh, I think I was, for the past few years, our biologists have been attending these uh, trainings. But then one challenge that remains with us is, uh, I think the, the, the course is so short. And after that, we, um, we, we, we try to convince our managers that we've attended this and we, we would want to share data. So after a few years, I think it's been five years that people have been advocating for us to share data and they finally approve. I think this year they've been saying, okay, go ahead. But one challenge we have as um, scientists and we have attended this training, I think we are still not literate. And I think the, the, the requirement of standardizing this data to submit is what frustrates us because after we got the go ahead, then we sit down and think, okay, what now? Then you realize that this, the format that w the data we have is not what is, it's not the standard that w w we would need to, to, f to feed OBIS. So I think those are the little frustrations. Well, this is a very common have. problem. You're not yes. the only one. So this, this is a very common problem. So yeah. they, they have a tool, this, this uh, IPT tool that helps you translate your data tables to the Darwin Core format, but a lot of people have trouble using that. Mm -hmm. But you know, we're we're willing to help. We can put you in contact with Obis at, at a higher level. They will work with you to get the data in. Uh, and so we're trying to find ways to address this issue because this this is a very common problem that people have. Either they don't have the money or the resources or the people to translate existing data into the Darwin Core format because it takes time. You know, it it, it is a, it, it does take effort. So. Uh, if you have data that you want to share, uh, give me a call, email me. We can put you in contact with the right obvious people to do that. So we, we have some resources that, and, and we're trying to find ways and experiences that help us automate that process. Hi, Frank. Thank you for your talk. Um, I just thought it would be important to mention another thing that we discussed uh, two weeks ago is that in this context of data sharing, um, that 
you have collected the data, but you don't own it. You don't own the environment. You don't have a exclusivity on uh, knowledge of a specific area, of a specific species or anything. So I think that's something important that our new generation, which is all of you, <laughs> has to think about because, and that we might have to uh, or try to change the way that we think about it because it's not what we get passed on from previous generations. Um, so we are usually told like, be careful and don't like <laughs> interact too much because they're gonna run off with all of your stuff. Um, but so, yeah, yeah, I think that's a, just a so Two things, I, I agree, some people will steal your data. It have, it's happened to me throughout my life. And yet at the same time, I think I have gotten more publications and more collaborations and involved in more projects because I have shared data. So everything from satellite data to in situ data. So the, the other thing is the idea of what data may be public and what data may not be public. That's a, that's a sensitive issue because there, there are data that you cannot share because you know, there may be defense purposes, there may be commercial purposes. And there, there may be proprietary data because a private company paid for it. So that data uh, legally can be protected. Some fisheries data you may, maybe don't want to share because people, well, if you know that the, somebody's telling me about Goliath grouper, if you know there's a grouper there, people will go kill it. Okay? So you may want to protect some data so people don't overuse a resource. Okay? So fisheries data is especially like that. Oil companies are notoriously protective of their data, but many private companies don't share the data. But if the data comes from a public project, okay, if it's paid by taxpayer money, typically that data should be open because it's, it's in the public domain. So there, there are different categories of data and it's not that simple in some cases to define what should be public or not. But in, in as a general principle, the kind of thing that we're doing for these purposes for the MBON, for the Sustainable Development Goal, for Aichi, that's a category of data where we can think that it's for the better, uh, for the better purposes of humanity, where you can share openly and, and do a lot of good. And again, you don't have to share everything. If we can identify indicators and we collect specific types of information and share that, you know, that that's what we need to share, not everything. But those are good points. Yeah. Oh, hi. I just wanted to ask why is it difficult to obtain spot data and world view? Why isn't spot data well, for those free? Are commercial data. So uh, the question is why are some satellite data available? Like uh, if, if there, is, there are government satellite data that are uh, on purpose mm -hmm. made openly available. Uh, now there's commercial satellite data that, are, that have a v commercial value. They're, they're made, satellites are launched by uh, or Northrop Grumman or uh, Digital Globe or some company, and they, they, they put investment, there, so it's a private enterprise, and they purchase the technology, they launch a satellite, it's very costly. Mm -hmm. So those, those private companies sell the data. It's not that you cannot get it, you have to pay for it. Now there's these, many of them, most of these companies have research programs, so you, if you contact them, you're able to get some of the data for your research with the agreement that you will not redistribute the data for free or openly, but then you can distribute uh, a derived product. Okay, so uh, Planet has that, uh, uh, Digital Globe does that. So many of these companies share the data with a researcher as long as you sign an agreement that you will not redistribute the data because then, of course, they're selling it. No? So it's not that you cannot get it, and it's not that they don't want to share it, but there's a value, it's, there's an investment, because it's like if I, if I make a bottle of water out of my money, I'm not gonna give it all away, you know, I, I want to make money. It's, 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 it, I'm, I'm totally for making money, you know, it's, it's okay. It's, it's okay to make money, it's, it's okay. But some of these things have a, a way to, if you wanna uh, work for research, there are ways of getting the data. And there's many programs around the world that uh, open it up if you don't redistribute the data. So, you know, I, I have some contacts. If you want to look at Worldview 2 data, we can find ways to do that. 
Well, the, the reason that the, it takes time to get the data out, remember these satellites are not global imagers like MODIS, uh, you know, they take pictures on a targeted basis. In many cases, their priority is to take a picture of a specific area for some reason. So they are not covering data the whole globe all the time. Okay? They take these, these uh, commercial satellites take pictures uh, in, in specific regions at certain times, but not everywhere all the time. Um, my other question is about the IOC best practices repository. I think that's very, very interesting. So you are uh, remodeling for to have more access and to be more friendly, maybe? Yeah, just look it up. Ocean Best Practices, IOC, you will go to that website. Uh, and we are, it, 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 you know, by the December time frame or so, we'll have a new interface, we'll you have a new, uh, it looks pretty, it's the same type of idea. You have a database of methods, protocols, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But in this case, we're doing semantic searches. It, it'll look prettier. But there's, uh, you know, we're already uploading several different documents into the Ocean Best Practices website. So go there, look at it. If you have a protocol that you want to share, uh, load it up. Yeah. Very good. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. My name is Isa, and I would like to um, say that data sharing, it's mostly not um, the fault of um, some scientists, because most scientists believe data science and data management belongs to the IT guys. So I think, yeah, um, for the network, for example, I was with LifeWatch in Europe, yeah, and we were understood that there were, there were a lot of infrastructure, data infrastructures that are available for scientists. I would like to suggest that for the network that maybe there should be some webinars that can enlighten scientists on data management and data sharing. Because uh, it's not also that scientists don't want to share data, but they are, let me say, they are ignorant because their interest is mostly to work, to work in the lab and keep the data for publication. So it's not a matter of that the data will be lost because there is a way you can uh, publish your data and curation is also a factor of data sharing. So, uh, so that's just my contribution, thank you. No, I, uh, that's a very good point. We do have webinars. That's why I suggest that you go to, to the GeoBahn webpage, sign up, and that, that will connect you to some webinars. If the same thing with the Global Ocean Observing System. You can sign up at the IOC webpage, and then you get, you, then you get put into these list servers. Our list server for GeoBon is not linked to the IOC Geo, uh, Goose list server. So they have their webinars. We have our webinars. We're trying to coordinate with OBIS to have webinars on a routine basis. OBIS has an extensive online videos and online instructions on how to share data through the Darwin Core Protocol. The problem is that people don't know about it, okay? So uh, it's, it's through fora like this where I can talk here and tell you about it and hopefully people will go use it. Probably a lot of people here will go home and not ever think about this anymore. But that's not the idea, okay? The, the idea is that, yes, the, if somebody here is interested in joining us, then they, that person can go talk to another few people and the, slowly you can expand and get people to know that these things exist. So the tools are there, the videos are there, the webinars are there. Uh, it's, it's just how, how do I make sure that you know that they exist and that you participate in the webinar when it happens? The only way is that you sign up and you get these emails and wow. you know, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll engage. And then you can go back to your country and tell other people about it. But that's the idea of a network. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I would like to add a little bit to what Isa said. Uh, so in the climate sciences, uh, what I realize is that, uh, for instance, SMF5, uh, the originators of the data actually have a time frame when data is ready to get out their publications. And then they release the data to other people to use. I think uh, the biodiversity network could use that uh, as a way of, instead of hoarding the data, you have a time frame where 
people use their originators use their data, make their publications, and then other people can use it. So that's a, that's a tool that's available in Obis. Obis has a way for you. You control your data. So you can, at the moment, you can use this IPT tool or any other way to get your data into Obis, but you have control. Until you publish the data, you can actually use the data within the context of all the Obis tools, mapping, trends. You can, there's many visualization tools and your data can be in Obis, but it can remain hidden, okay, only available to you. The day that you want to publish it openly, you just turn a button and it, it's available. So that, that capability already exists. Obis is not a completely open data set until you decide to make it public. So many programs have this embargo period, you know, where you have two years, three years, or, and until you quality control your data or it gives you a chance to publish. I mean, I, I'm of the mind that if once my data are good, I publish it you know, openly. Okay? Not a paper, but really totally open in, in a website. So I've done that many times and a lot of people use it. <coughs> but they're, they're, if people are willing to go and respect that embargo period, like this issue with Antares, they, they talked about this embargo period. The embargo period expired 10 years ago and they still have not released the data. So that, that's a that's a problem, okay? and there's many groups that do that. There's another group in the Caribbean, CARICOMP, and I'll, I'll say the names of these groups. Because these, these people uh, agree to share the data, make it open. Ten years go by after the embargo period that they themselves agreed on, uh, they would follow, and they, they still don't share the data. And then what happens is in many cases the person that was in charge, the IT person that was in charge of the data, that person goes away, the disk is corrupted, the data is lost. Okay, so this is this happens over and over and over, and it's a it's a shame. You know, at least if you put a novice and you put a switch on it, at least it's stored. You know? Hi. Uh, so I have a question that I think pertains to a lot of people here. Um, so it's about you mentioning that marine technology, the prices were too high and they needed to be distributed among other countries. And I know a lot of people here, they've said that their universities or even their countries don't have the available, like the technology available to do their research. So what do you suggest that we do about that? I know a lot of industries that sell marine technology are based in developing countries and the prices are high. So should we have some incentives for them to sell it at lower prices to developing countries? And, and by incentives, I guess I mean like money yeah, that's so not a bad idea. yeah so who would provi provide that money like would it be the UN because then it would be the developing well, the UN has no money I mean, yeah the the developing countries would or the developed countries provide funds like through certain projects at least from what I understand through yeah, the UN I mean, you may you, uh, increasingly you have private groups uh, so non-governmental organizations like Oceana or Conservation International or Nature Conservancy that are interested in these processes. You do have the World Bank that has, uh, if, if one country or several countries can agree in requesting funds to the World Bank, typically th developing nations, they, they can get very substantial funds to, to do this. You can work with industry and, you know, it, it, if you have a, a network of students Industry is interested in promoting their products. So if you engage and they give you prototypes or, or, or you help them uh, you know, advertise their product or use it, then you are kind of hooked on their product. And then you, they, they do it as a promotional way where you can get cer certain uh, devices or computers uh, or m instruments that are at a discount for either education purposes or sometimes even free, but you have to, as a group, organize yourselves, contact different manufacturers. Another thing is universities have uh, innovation labs or uh, innovation administrators, uh, research, uh, sponsored research offices. So sometimes you can go to those offices as a, as a group of students. Maybe you can organize, I mean, this may take some effort, but you may get three, four, 10 universities in different parts of the world Organize yourself and propose an idea to a manufacturer. So you, I, we know that you have this type of microscope. We want to work with you to lower the price. We have a group of students in an engineering lab that can bring it down. So may, may be creative. Don't don't. Uh, there's no one single solution to this. Just you know, 
the, the power that you have is in the number of people that you have as a network. I have a follow-up question to that. So do you think it would be a possibility for companies to outsource to developing countries and actually offer like these uh, their technology at a lower price to the countries that they're yeah, producing they, in? They, they or do it do all you, the time. Or do you think that would like uh, easily lead to over-exploitation of these countries? All of the above. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so I think we are approaching the, the end of the, of the oh, morning thank you. session. Delight. <laughs> thank you, Frank.